evening, and I will now call this meeting to the, of the APC to order. Please rise for our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, just a reminder, tonight uh, there doesn't seem to be a public hearing on our agenda. Um, so, therefore, this, this meeting here um, will be a meeting that uh, we can discuss what's on our agenda as a board and hopefully come to some kind of reasonable uh, readiness for, for, for a public hearing for, for what's on our agenda. Uh, I'd remind everyone to please silence their phones if they haven't, and we'll begin with a uh, roll call. Darren Price. Here. Leota. Is absent. Brian Durham. Here. Ed. Here. Okay. Ed is on Zoom. Gary Naylor. Present. Kathy Rhodes. Present. Brian Robb. Here. Bill Mackey. Brian Hensley. Here. Bill McDaniel. Present. Jeff Wesling. Present. And myself. And we do have a quorum, don't we? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we'll begin with uh, the approval of the minutes of the September 24th APC meeting as presented. Uh, I just have one uh, correction. Number seven, the adjournment. Uh, it's Darren Price, not Brian Price. Oh, man. <laughs> but other than that, I, I moved to uh, approve those minutes as, as I just am really going to butcher your name up. Eh? <laughs> Poor Derek. <laughs> There's motion made and seconded. Um, I believe Brian or Darren. Uh, who, who I made the motion, Darren seconded. Darren, Darren seconded second. the motion uh, to uh, accept the minutes as amended. Um, are there any discussions? Um, I think on the minutes we'll just do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, the same. Motion carries. Um, next, we'll uh, move to our, the, the bulk of our agenda tonight. Um, we were we started the discussion last month on a proposed new confined feeding rules or ordinance um, brian has done uh, a great deal with the help of a lot of you others that have had input on some paperwork um, or a draft um, i'll just open the floor for any Questions, discussions on what Brian's presented, um, or, or maybe I should start with our uh, legal counsel, uh, Jeff. Does that do, do you see things that we need to talk about from a legality standpoint before we? I, I think I think Brian's done an outstanding job on this. Um, and I think we've all had kind of some discussions. I think it needs some um, refinement as far as, I'm not sure um, where the numbers come from, like on where it starts with section three. I think we need to clean some of that up and that's discussions I can have with him. Well, I can that, reformat those into the- That's not really, that's not really content. The con, that's not really necessary for us to have a big discussion. So there's a lot of copying and pasting and right, right. it didn't, right. there are some places where it was like ABC, some places that were one, two, three. <laughs> Like it's it's a weird outline yeah. to, we, we, to start from. We we've got we I think we can clean that up pretty easily. Um, I guess legally from a legal standpoint, um, a couple things that I would would ask you to look at. Um, 
he's got in there the, the um, compliance with the right farm act. Um, he's also got um, some some language regarding ag activity and agricultural clause. I would get rid of that stuff personally. Um, the problem when you start citing um, acts and Indiana codes when they change, when they change. The ordinances. And, and there's really no benefit to us to have it in there. Um, that's the law period in the story. We can't really play with that. Um, so so it'd probably be my recommendation for the board to get rid of those. Um, Specifically where are you referring to? Well, so number nine three on the nine. first page. Uh, three on page uh, two. And on page three, also number three at the bottom, uh, the number three that says all applicants. Right. So number three at the top on page two where it says notice of agriculture. Right. And then page three, the second number three on page, page three where it says all applicants. I definitely think that should be deleted. Okay. And then I have, um, I have a um, question about on the first page definitions to livestock structure. I mean, if we start talking about that, I think we're going to want me to define that probably differently. Does that make sense? Yeah. You look at that because I is that if you know if you have a barn with one cow in it, is that a, is that a livestock structure? What's the you know what what do we want to define that as? Okay. And that might be something more for you guys to talk about than me. Or you can just say, hey, Jeff, just put the you know legal de definition of that in there that makes sense in the, in the ordinance. And then lastly, I guess my last comment, and um, I'll be happy, obviously, to, uh, to answer other questions, but there's also an issue with, not an issue with, but I think it could be, um, it's just something we might want to talk about, is the minimum setback for any structure, which is on page three. three. Yeah, yeah, I had a question. So it's essentially, you know, where, where are we wanting that to be from? Um, I think we can clean that up a little bit too. But I, but I'll, I'll tell you right now that Brian, as far as content goes, as far as, as far as getting us a really close spot of something that we can really move from, I think he did an incredible job. Thank you. Well, as you referred to right there, I don't think the from any structure is necessary because when you're looking at any of the setbacks, you're talking about the, the setback of the yard is there's no development within that setback. Right. So from a, uh, from a zoning perspective, that's implying it isn't going to be within that 100 feet. You're suggesting to uh, omit that altogether? Mm -hmm. Just I think that's uh, just that last part from any structure. Oh, from yeah. the next one. J yeah. Just the three words. Just the three words. Yeah, yeah right. So then, then does it become property line? Well, no. Well, it's always the property line is what you was where you're measuring it from anyway. Okay. So then, how do we? All right. The, uh, for an instance, um, if we maintain a hundred feet setback from the property line however if we move it for instance to the west within 50 feet of the property line or or um, to better accommodate to the um, east of us our neighbor to the east how do we accommodate that then okay, that would typically to, that would be through a variance I mean, uh, as long as it doesn't we could do that in, too. In, in, impede on the neighbor to the west, uh, it, it makes sense to me to, to, to make it more user-friendly to, to have something in there that allows us to move that to better accommodate neighbors or... or no, that makes sense to, to have a leeway, I mean, have the... You know the permitted. I mean, how do you do that limits. language with what's, that? I guess what's your question? Okay, he's asking about a variance to move from the hundred feet uh, setback. Say I have a parcel, and the perfect spot is only fifty feet from the property line on the the west side of the property. How do we 
So for you, CFOs is a, is a special or is a special exception, right? Then you'd ask for a special exception, but you'd have to ask for a variance, and that variance is how you get inside of those numbers. Okay, but, but I'll tell you, at 100 minute. feet, logistically, a CFO, and I'm certainly not an expert in this field, but I think you're probably not going to have a lot of instances where you're going to have a smaller setback than that anyway. You know, I mean, we can permit them on one acre. That doesn't mean you can actually put one on one acre. Right. Right. So I don't know if you're going to have any that are hunting. And Gary, you might know better than I. I guess I think it'd be hard to even get them within a hundred feet anyway. Of a property line. Right. Well, the only thing that I'm looking at, for instance, the the business that uh, the company I work for, they went out and bought a parcel of ground, and sub subdivided it off the a farm, in order to build their their building um, and so that that opened up the issue that they had to buy X number of acres to get those setbacks from the property lines and I mean yeah I see what you're saying but you're are we talking about the actual livestock structure are we talking about buildings associated with it or well, I think this is actually talk. Isn't this talking about the livestock building itself? Well, has to I be a hundred feet away. I think we need to make sure that's a hundred percent clear. Yes, yes. the so livestock right. building, lagoons, and right. so on. I mean, is this the standard bill see, for see, any other different. building? I don't think this means the, the lagoon has to be a hundred feet. No, no. I don't think this means that the windbreak. This the if we want to have a, a shelter belt conversation. I mean, I don't think the shelter belt needs. questions requirements in our in our ordinance okay. in our zoning ordinance well yeah, the only it's, other it's like one five. off the top of my head that okay. has a pretty significant uh, setback in the a1 and the a2 district or a dwelling or any other structure in uh, those is from the road is 50 feet already. Okay, so so if I guess my question would be, and, and here again I'm just throwing some what ifs out here, maybe being a devil's advocate, maybe a little bit, but I guess what are we gaining by having this much of a setback? Because we've all we have in this writing we've already got our setbacks from our res residential we've got our setbacks from any other pr property owner what what's the what's the reasoning for wanting to build that building a hundred feet away from my own property line for instance yeah I, I mean I don't know that there's valid reasons to have setbacks from property lines. Uh, yes, I did, and I'm not arguing that. I'm just arguing the distance. Why, why is it important for that 100 feet? Because we've already established in the ordinance that I got to So it's got to be 100 feet because that's already determined from something else. Yeah. So I, I, I guess... Yeah, we, I mean, I guess... That I would. don't have a problem with the... Having a setback. You just think maybe it should be 50 or... Our... I, I know. It. No, I get what you're saying. That makes sense. Um, I would almost say that maybe just the front, like a front setback, like to be 100 feet from the road on a front setback as opposed to 50. I mean, at that point, we're splitting hair. We can make it a property line. Right? Wells are generally 50 feet from a property line, right? Correct. Is that state code or is that just the traditional ordinance? I know that's some other counties, but I think that might be the actual. State. Yeah. The development plans, you'd be hard pressed to. Yeah. 
with just a 50 foot setback on a frontage for truck turnaround and that kind of stuff anyway. Rear needs to be a hundred feet. It, I mean, I mean, this could is, this could cost a was a trailer fifty three feet. Someone a standard trailer. Sir, right, livestock building. Well, it still requires at least ten acres. Right, right. Are you sure there's a, I don't know if there's a minimum acre. Or we're, we, okay, we, no, put, yeah, yeah. we put a minimum acre. So if we're, if we're requiring 10 acres. Sixteen hundred and twenty feet from the structure. Something you guys could talk about that to reduce it from 100 to 50. 50 is still a very reasonable number. That's it. I mean, that's it. And, and a situation. The actual language in the zoning code is you need to change the provision on the actual uh, width, width of the frontage because the actual language. Road frontage. That, that's the language that was adopted in this in the zoning code in 1993. Is back off the road and they have a, a driveway access, which we would like to encourage them to get it. Keep it back off the road. Five hundred feet. Think of what a ten acre. I mean, yeah, I'm trying like, to measure. You could have a long easement to it or something. I'm you know, sorry. Well, if it's got like an easement back to it or something like that. Well, you know. well. like with uh, John Naylor. Mm -hmm. They allowed it to, okay, to reduce it because it, so it would not impinge on the, uh, the corporation land, farmland. Mm -hmm. And then also the, uh, it was the same thing with McDivitt's, you know, when they split their house off. Mm -hmm. uh, because another practical side is uh, looking at something more narrow is that the, uh, the frequent requirement is that banks place on uh, with the refinancing is to split the house off and then you have to have the drive that meets the requirement. So you do that so that so if you provide in the A1, A2, you can then actually say provide a uh, something in, in here with saying, okay, so make it 50 feet, for example. And that would be much more reasonable than say having to provide 150 feet of uh, drive. Well, and, and in, in this instance... 500 feet's a huge amount. Yes, it is. About it. I mean, a hundred is gobs plenty for semi travel. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking I, I, I own a 400 foot wide lot. Okay. And and the idea that you'd have to have a hundred more feet of that, that's a, and it's a seven acre lot. So I mean, yeah. I'm trying to think a ten acre lot. I mean, that's yeah. that's tough. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of width. I don't know what the purpose is. I guess. Yeah. I, I I guess. What do we think? I mean, what do we? What do you think that? What, what's the well, value? Well, I guess. Yeah, I think the five hundred really is unreasonable. Right. You do agree with that, then, Bill? Well, I, I do agree with that. It's probably closer to about half of that, right? Uh, well, I'm thinking a hundred is plenty. Yeah. I mean, because if you're to go to the same for residential structure in that particular, in the A1 zoning district, that'd be 150 feet. So, you know, for a residential structure, but if you could always. First, for uses out there, uh, you could actually then call for something with less than that. So, what you're saying, the the our zoning laws now, a residential 
home would require 150 feet of road front. In the A1 district. In the A1 because district. Because the building pocket. Think well, about I can pocket. live with staying with that. Okay. Uh, so I mean, the yeah, so the road frontage is the same as per the uh, so single family dwelling in the any district. Uh, any other house down down the road, you know. Uh, I, but I just couldn't see the need for the 500 <laughs> because, uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, most people that are building these buildings now are not anywhere close to the road. No, right. They they want them back off the road. They want them. For the biosecurity and the security, both, uh, and uh, would would I mean so most of them I've seen being built have been back road, way back off the road, yeah, yeah. back off the road. Yeah. Looking at the setbacks, do we want to leave the the hundred feet in the front, which would be towards the road, and reduce the side and rear by half? I mean. What's everyone thinking about? There again, I was just I, I was just asking to make you a minimum. You're 100 feet off the road, minimum. Is that far enough? I mean, probably. Can I offer an item, expert like an item, not a comment on the ordinance, but items regulations? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, items regulations call for 100 feet off of since we're six feet. Is this okay? Um, Item regulations call for 100 feet from property lines, roads, um, wells, those kinds of things. However, what I will caution you is that item is very, uh, they grant exceptions to that property line setback a lot. Not so much with roads or wells or water, you know, not so much with other things, but when it comes to property lines, um, one of the things that happens in IDEM, and I'll let Bill comment whether that affects the zoning, but IDEM recognizes parcel lines. So, for example, if um, it's, you know, Fayette County Swine LLC that owns a 10-acre parcel that they're going to put a barn on, and they own the adjoining 40 acres around it, IDEM forces them to be 100 feet from the parcel line. As Even well as the property line. All of it. So that's why I think it might be important. Whatever number you pick, you do have some protection from item on the road. They're not going to, item doesn't, it's, an, it's a rare instance that item will allow them to get 100 feet closer to the road. Um, it is quite common for item to waive that 100 foot property line or parcel line setback with an acknowledgement from the adjoining property owner. So as long as the adjoining property owner says it's okay, you know, those sorts of things happen. That's just some, like I said, you know, you're, well, there is some protection there with IDEM in terms of that 100 feet off the road. Th then if th th these are IDEM numbers, why not leave them here, but yet we know that they can come to the BCA we, we for a variance. variance, right? And the rationale with the variance is there, therefore the IDEM has granted a, permission a 50 to foot setback. Yeah. And it sounds like if that happens, then they'd be able to come to us and request it and say, hey, we had to get the neighbor on board with it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, by that point, we require them to submit their item application. Would that have been something that well, would have... It would, be yeah, it would already have it been would be included, already on, included. Yeah. on the application. Mm -hmm. So they, we could do a two birds yeah. type thing. Like exactly. Have because we have had variance. people who have requested both special exceptions and variances with them in the past. Okay. That, so let's just leave it there then. So we want to change the road frontage to 150 feet, leave the minimum setback um, at 100. Uh, okay, what well, I'm thinking is that same as for the single family dwelling in the zoning district. In the A1, it's 150 feet. In the A2 district, it's 75 feet. So if you're going to make it consistent with the zoning code or any other. I'm sorry, Bill, I didn't. I okay. was reading well, A2 well, it would 75 be A1, feet. it would be 150. Okay. Because it's one half of 300 feet required feet. Okay, in the A2, it would be 75 feet because it's one half of the required lot width of 150 feet. In A2? In A2. And you're suggesting then to put language in here for both? Yeah, indicate, a, yeah basically areas. language is going to indicate that the road frontage as required for uh, the, any other use in that, per, such as a single family dwelling in that particular okay. zoning district. I, I, I'm, is everybody... So if it's in an A1, it's um, 150. If it's mm -hmm. in an A2, it's 75. And from a legality standpoint, it follows 
every, every other, mm -hmm. it's right? It's I mean, consistent. so it, yeah. we wouldn't have a problem with that, right? Sure. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh. Another one I don't think is, I think, necessary, because as of several years ago, that uh, I haven't found the actual ruling, but there was a ruling that was, is at the time was going on primarily with uh, wind turbines, and was casting doubt on the uh, use of reciprocal setback, separation distance, as a regulatory taking. So, and quite honestly, is I don't think someone is going to want to build a house. If they're going to have a property there. The odds are they want to want to build closer than that anyway. The case you're talking about in Indiana went up for appeal. Yeah. They argued reciprocal setbacks was not about was not constitutional. Yeah. Okay. Reciprocal setbacks just to make you guys probably already all know you're very smart people. But it essentially says that um, not only can theirs be that close, but then you can't build a house close to the CFO either. Yeah. Okay. So it kind of makes it to where neither can happen. Um, that case went up on appeal, um, and there were like two other issues involved mm -hmm. in that case. Yeah. The court of appeals hurt the other two issues, mm -hmm. maybe three issues. Don't I mean they hurt mm -hmm. other issues. Um, that, that essentially made the case change and go back, mm -hmm. and so they did not consider the reciprocal, reciprocal setback, setback because they didn't need to. Okay. And the Court of Appeals tends to do that rather than cleaning it up; yep. they just left it there. So okay. it, it was it was a part of an argument, but to me, reading that case, it didn't really define whether or not it's legal or not. Okay. Right. Um, right. Reciprocal setbacks do make me a little touchy. Um, on representing you guys in the future if somebody wants to build a house. I mean, they, the, it, it's a little, it, it, I, I see the argument for both ways, yeah. um, and I feel comfortable arguing for both ways. Uh, probably safer and cleaner not to have the reciprocal yeah. setback, but I, but I get the argument for it here. Yeah, because, yeah, because I think that, you know, me personally as the, well, of course, even as the attorney, is that the, you know, the risk with having something in there that can actually potentially be seen as a regulatory taken. Right, and also probably, not, I mean, I don't know how many people are going to rush to build their yeah. house. You know, with a, and it, it should take care of itself, you would right. think, but it's still, it's a little, it's a little. But tricky. I mean, if somebody wants to build a house, who cares where they want to build a house? I mean, I'm, I don't care if somebody wants to build a house next to, I, I no, live near a Rumpke dump, dump, so. I mean. I had a house built next to a, a Rumpke dump. dump. So. But this doesn't affect that family from building on that no. mm -mm. property or mm -mm. closer, mm -mm. does it? I mean, if they so desire. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you got rid of reciprocal setback, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't impact mm -hmm. anybody's ability okay. to build a house. All right. All right. Now, then one I have a question, hey, Brian, about the residential subdivisions within a quarter mile of an agricultural zone must be addressed following as part of the primary approval. Of course, something with the primary approval, that really needs to be in the uh, subdivision standards, but uh, where, where did you find that? I'm just curious. That was, that's about the offsite, was that? That was from the ordinance that exists right now. What language right is now. that? Where are we at? Where are we at, Bill? I'm sorry. Residential subdivisions, property within Number four. Or oh. quarter mile. That's already in our... It, it's already buried in there. So yeah, you know, that's a copy and paste I, that already existed. I, I don't think that's necessary. Because once again, we're getting into something that really is goes beyond just making the decision on siting a uh, subdivision. I mean, a uh, confined feeding operation. Yeah, you're saying then that number four should on yeah. the same page should be Racket. struck. Racket. Is everybody on board with that? Or yeah. Okay. Yep. Whack it. Whack them all. Hey, you guys are doing an excellent job, by the way. The discussion is phenomenal. Did we? Did we? What, what do we think about the reciprocal setbacks? I'm fine with axing the reciprocal setbacks. If, I mean, okay. That's number one above that. Yeah. Okay. Reciprocal setbacks. Okay. okay. Oh, we've had some conversation about the development standards. Is uh, Gary? Could you read the uh, comments from Bill? Uh, Bill Mackey, since he wasn't able to be here. All right. Uh, comment that Bill made. Um, and I'm reading it as he wrote it. I do not like the idea of having one standard distance for all setbacks. I am not sure about the 1320 
1,320 feet distance. I do think it needs to be less than the 1,620. Maybe 1,500 feet would be a better option. Um, and what's that referring to? Uh, uh, development standards number. Uh, well, yeah, it's the, basically Bill saying that uh, he doesn't have a problem with just being uh, all the way across the board the same line. I apologize. He does or doesn't? He does not have a problem with that. I misunderstood. I do not like the idea of having one standard. No, Bill, that's oh, not that what, what he said? says. He says, I do not like the idea of having one standard distance for all set. Okay. Uh -huh. but no, it says, I, no, it says, I do like. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I do like the idea. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought. I, okay, I read that wrong. I apologize. Oh, yeah, okay. I didn't think I read that wrong earlier. And the, and the reason I went with the one quarter, because it was simple, like a quarter mile is a very simple, with 1,320 feet versus the 1,620, it just seemed easy to say quarter mile. What? Well, but I, I, 1,500 is fine, fine too, it just makes it a... Yeah. And, uh, and For instance, let me ask, it, so I can put it in perspective yeah. of some existing operations. Um, um, and, and I hate to mention them, but the, the two that are already in our county, mm -hmm. Uh, recent ones. Where could they still be sitting there at 1,620 feet? Where they're at? Oh, I haven't run the math on that since we went I mean, the ordinance. Uh, I don't think there would have I, been any problem with placing them in either of those locations. I, I don't think because, so. Because I, because I I'm know trying under, to picture a quarter mile. Because I know mile. under the quarter mile that it would not have been a problem. Okay, all right. Okay. Because though, when I went through, whereas testing different locations in different uh, townships as I, those are the two of the locations I used. Um, and I, I guess while we're discussing, I, as we're discussing that, uh, those distances, um, the paper, I'm, I'm not sure if you sent this, Brian, with the charts of the other counties or, I, I can't remember. No, I didn't. That was that was, was, your, was, was yeah. that your? That was early on. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of variance. Yeah. With these like counties, Wayne County, I, mean, I think it's a 600 foot, foot separation yeah. distance. Yeah, Wayne County's County, 600 feet, 1320 yeah. from any other right. zoning district. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I thought that was huge because that would get us away from having to include all the the hamlets because most already have another zoning district within that. Mm -hmm that hamlet um, and the same with the church most of our small hamlets have a church nearby that gives you that separation distance from that property already mm -hmm. so it, by well, saying other zoning district meaning outside of a1 or a2 uh, i guess separated. even though i'm i'm very pro ag and i think everybody i i don't, I don't think anybody doesn't know that but uh, I still want to make sure we protect our residential homes as well and, and, and our other uh, zoning mm -hmm. districts. Um, I just wonder, for instance, if that goes from 1620 to 2000 feet, how many people that would might put out of being able to build mm -hmm. or, or expand their farming operation? You know, it, I would like to go as far as we can without hindering ag away from those areas. Right. Yeah. And I, if, I if you see map, what I'm saying. Yeah, I took the zoning map that uh, that we have, and uh, I I kept you know using the measuring tool to see you know, and I always ran into another either another house, another church, uh, another zoning district um, outside the city. So the you know. Looking at the city of Connersville, I mean, it, the city's pretty protected with zoning districts all along it uh, compared to the, the city limits map to the, mm -hmm. the zoning district. There's uh, residential suburban all the way out past past Gray Road uh, to the west, uh, to the east, all the way out Woodside Village to the south, Wells View. Like, all those are, I mean, it's a, it's a huge portion of districts that exist uh, outside of the city 
Uh, Bentonville is residential suburban. Everton's residential suburban. Uh, Alquina, there's a a business, uh, a small business zone district in Alquina that would protect all of Alquina, even though it's not. It's A2. Mm -hmm. There's one parcel that is a business. Zone. Is a business that makes it, you know, that created that, that separation yeah. distance. So everywhere I looked, there was something that created that separation distance. Uh, west of town, out in Pleasant View, is residential suburban. South, uh, and just outside of town with Riverbend Estates, there's a, there's a large district there. Shelton's Platte, there's a huge district there. Uh, Waterloo was the one that does not have anything that's not uh, A1. That was the one area where it's, and I haven't been to Waterloo in a while, but I'm assuming there's a church somewhere near Waterloo well, that we there, there is, but it's up the road. It was a, uh, yeah, basically it's a, it's a uh, evangelical pole barn church up the road. It was a conversion. Isn't that subdivision, isn't that a no, it's, R? No, that is A1. Oh, it is. Waterloo no, is A2. A2. Is it A2? It's A2. The only part wow. that's A1 is okay. on the Harrison. Yeah. Now, the Fairfield. that surprised me. I figured it'd be a sort of a business. A, some type of business yeah, district but, there or something. But it does have a subdivision, and the as with uh, in Alquina, the uh, it's a even though the map does not show it, is even the, uh, all the lots out there, there's even an actual. They're all part of a platted subdivision. Everything there, not just the winding creek, but also the, uh, uh, the on the other side of the, uh, the county road to the west. So all of that is actually within a platted subdivision. Right. But now, now if you look, if you were to look at the Waterloo maps, you'll see the huge effect, and it's the and it's. And I don't really think that it needs to be as much as we initially put for the churches. So if you'll, you'll see a huge circle out there, Waterloo Township, and that's centered around that uh, evangelical church that's mm -hmm. just, just to the east of the uh, Waterloo. It's under the current. Under the current. Current rules. And yeah. that, that consumes a huge amount of space. So if you do decide to ratchet some of those back, is it will increase in uh, some parts of the county a pretty fair amount of must be 40 minutes approaching but uh so if you do go with that you ratchet some of those back you will increase the amount of land with potential for uh, confined feeding uh the now some parts of the county is there won't probably make as much of a difference because if you get down in parts of uh, southern parts of Orange, parts of Jackson, and also Columbia, I found out early on it's pretty hard to find some place that is less than a quarter mile from another dwelling down there. Mm -hmm. It isn't easy. It's possible, but it isn't easy. So I, I guess Bill's suggestion is even less than the 16th, the quarter of a mile. He's he's suggesting 1,500. Well, that's well, 13, 13 more than quarter 20 mile. is a quarter mile. 16, or, 20 is 300 feet is more a than a quarter mile. So, okay. So. Uh, and that was actually changed um, when it went to the commissioners because before it was a quarter mile, and then they added 300 feet yeah, to the were, separation distance. Yeah. So because the rationale that was added to the okay. separation distance was they asked me what in the A1 district is the actual. Uh, had to do with the lot with the uh, the setback for a dwelling from a property line, so that's why that's why they added the 300 feet. I see. Okay. That's where that came from. All right. And then uh, with with regard to planted subdivisions, you know, I, I changed it to another zoning district to eliminate planted subdivisions because they're. Uh, it allows the people who, if you live in Waterloo and you want to create a residential suburban district, you can ask to create a residential suburban district. I don't want to force it on somebody to, if right. somebody who lives near Waterloo wants to okay. build a, a structure right now, they would be permitted well, to well, do so. Well, if you're reducing that down to a quarter of a mile, the only real difference that you have is instead of the, from the property boundary, it's actually the distance a quarter mile from the structure. Yeah. yeah. Well, with the zoning district, it's if the whole parcel is 
Yeah, the plan the whole that's measured from the parcel yeah. if you have one that backs right on the actual edge of the subdivision. So you have additional feet. Oh, yeah, you have all those structures along. Yeah, so if you have the dwelling, then each one is actually plotted individually. Yeah. So even Alquina, the last house, or the first house, if I'm coming in on Alquina Road, there's an automatic separation distance from the structure itself that's a quarter mile from the first house. So if you're headed uh, east-west on Alquina Road, that if you wanted to, you'd have to be a quarter mile from Alquina. Or the, the houses in Alquina, you already have to be a quarter mile in this. Right uh, but, uh, Bill, if you can text me Ed uh, Harold's email address, please, I will go ahead and start a new meeting for him. Okay, oh crap, my cell phone's at home. Let's see, Ed Harold. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, let's get Ed. Yeah, because it's charging, is it's down, I put it on the charger on that one. Okay. I'm trying to contact Ed uh, on the Zoom meeting. Oh, I got it. All right, I will send that and start a new meeting with him shortly. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so are we happy with the quarter mile? Do we want 1500 as Bill has suggested? Mackie, that is. Um, or do we want more? Do we want less? Do we, what, what's the general consensus? I'm fine either way. I just, I just thought quarter mile was an easy... Well, it's a nice round figure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... But, well, like I said, I'm interested, to be, I'm know, interested in mile. protecting the residents as much as possible without hindering ag at the same time. Um, and, and that's why I would much rather have... I, I'd much rather see, I'm like Bill, one setback for everything. Right. Well, I have the maps. I mean... I said. Well, I guess, I guess looking at it from your perspective, Gary, it, is that additional 200 feet going to hinder that much? Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know that it's going to hinder. That's what I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. You know, does 2,000 feet hinder ag growth? I. I, I, I uh, it will because one of the tests I did early on was at a half mile from dwellings, which you're pushing that 2,000 feet, you're pushing it, uh, oh, you're about yeah, more, than, more than a third of a mile. So by the time you've got up to about 2,000, I mean a, a half mile, there's virtually no place. I mean, there's even less up in Posey and Fairview that you okay, can put okay. one in on. Okay, so, okay. So that is too far then. Yeah, I, I think it really is. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so I'd, half, ha I'd have to run a... Half a mile, you're looking at, what, like, 2,500 feet, or 2,640? 2,640. Yeah. yeah. And I just sent... Some easy yeah, I just sent John um, two maps, if he could... It's okay. the, the city okay. and then the zoning districts around the, the city to show you the, the difference on how much farther it would be. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you look at those maps I provided you, because those have two distances, 1,000 feet and then two thousand uh, and a quarter mile on those colored maps I showed you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea of, say, without having to run through an analysis again, what could happen is if uh, if you do increase yes, like two thousand. Uh, turn on your camera, please. I can control from here then. John needs a control. Okay, um, so fifteen hundred, or do you want to leave it at the thirteen twenty? Well, if, if John uh, will bring up the, if he can bring up those those maps just to. And I guess I wondered, I wondered... Just as a visual reference so that you can see what what it would be from the city. Even, well, and, and I guess what and concerns area, me about the... Because of the population density that we have, you know. Yeah. Well, you can also get an idea of that if you happen to look at the ones for the Connersville Township maps for the, uh, all those, all those color maps for Connersville Township. See how heavily it is. 
So those will help make the same point. Same things with the ones for Harrison Township. My my concern with Connorsville and, and the incorporated cities and towns, I I don't want to hinder their growth either. Right. At the same time. I, I wondered if we wanted to look at a, a possible um, larger setback on our incorporated towns and cities. Buffer. Because right now they're one mile. One mile, yeah. Which, did you leave that in here? No, right, it's quarter mile. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's why. Well, no, there isn't, it doesn't necessarily specify cities and towns incorporated areas, it's just other zoning districts. So anytime an R happens or, or commercial or anything anything happens besides agricultural A1 or A2, then you have that setback. Yeah. The, the Right now in, the, in this language would be the quarter mile. Right? Yeah. So here, let me... But if we create the mile buffer around incorporated cities and towns... I, I, I think I like Brian's language better than I like incorporated cities and towns just because we're, they don't have lines like you think they have. Yes, and Gary, look. Okay. You, you see the city? That's the city. Mm -hmm. If you go to the map around the city, look how much now, more Linwood's pretty straightforward. around the city is. Right, right. Well, Linwood's incorporated. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I'm guessing most of the others are incorporated. See, all this no, is, no, none yeah, of the others are incorporated. Yeah. And, and, and the residential suburban keeps going so south of that. Well, all that separation. Some of them, this is the way out by uh, west of town and then the country club because yeah. uh, yeah, Don Conference House is the last house in the city limits. So you automatically have to be out by like 300 west is the closest road that you could even consider putting a. Well, okay, I and, understand that. And, yeah. and that gets to, because that also speaks to uh, If I go out to the West with, uh, and what put that house, or that, that hog barn, barn, or cattle barn, or what? Cape Well, no, it actually have to be farther than that because you run into uh, Pleasant View, which is more, closer than a quarter mile. So you're. Okay, well, I mean, I know places where if you get sold, within like, that distance. Is that a subdivision? You're almost out in the field, or, you know. Does that hinder the future of the. City we have some that are just platted, but no not one wants to build that direction. But, yeah. So no, I see what you're saying. So see what I'm saying? Uh, you're almost a fair view before you uh, uh, before you have enough separation. You can actually say that okay. some of them are basically deep. It's, it's pretty far out there. But well, that's okay. really uh, there's lots of houses. The only thing okay. you can do that is auto automatically create another another new line yeah. is what you're saying from the house itself. Yeah. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying. Then. And you so want to avoid separates that. the zoning district, and then you still have the structure uh, okay. from another residence. Okay, all right. Which we can make the res. I mean, if 1,500 feet's the the golden number versus 1,620. I mean, you're still separated by how any house that's not the person operating the CFO. Mm-hmm. Because their house doesn't. If they live in the house, it doesn't. Count. It doesn't apply. Right. Okay. All right. So, uh, but Jeff, you would rather leave that language out of a buffer, creating a buffer. Correct. From a legality just, standpoint. Just, just from a clarity perspective, I think it. I mean, and I think there's a. I think there's an important distinction that some of these smaller um, subdivisions may need to. May need. They could. They can come in here and ask to be rezoned. I mean, that would clear the. If they went for a residential zone, if they went for, if they applied to get rezoned. That might clean them up if they think, hey, we want to extend some of those. Um, yeah. The okay. other thing, I don't want to keep you guys continuously going, but one other thing we've talked about that we've not talked about tonight is at some point we've got to talk about whether this is, we are going to have a permitted use or if they're all going to be special exceptions. <coughs> um, a good point. Ideas? I'm fine with making it up. A permitted use if they meet these qualifications. Yeah, yeah. yeah if, if they've met the qualifications and it's already agricultural anyway, I, that would be fine. And that's where I'm at. I, I, I too, agree that if you meet these qualifications or whatever those qualifications may be, right. then it should be 
permitted in an ag zoned area. Uh, if you don't meet these, we have the BZA that you can come and ask for variances. Mm -hmm. Or is that? I mean, that makes sense. Does that work from the leg legality standpoint? I mean, if, if yeah. you don't meet the uh, the permitted, they they have the right to petition. Yes. It doesn't mean the BZA would have to grant the petition. Right. They do right. Have the right to right. petition. Yeah. But if they meet all the qualifications, then they don't. Then they have the right to. Or he could he could just sign off on it in the office. And and go on. Right. Go yeah. On. Now. Bill, one thing that I wanted to ask, yeah. I'm of the opinion, I think, and maybe things have changed now, and I'm behind times, but ag does not, we do, do we require building permits for ag? Okay, uh, things Production. like uh, barns, no. Uh, the, these ones do because it's an industrial type structure. So you, you, they, they have to get a building permit from you, and you have to inspect it mm -hmm. as it's being built, just like any yeah. other building structure. Yep. Well, okay. for example, uh, out there with the DNA genetics. Right. Okay. Just for the, okay, the foundations and the footings and the uh, the floors. I was out there probably about a dozen times. Okay. Because okay. each time they're going to do it. All right. Okay. And and that's what I wanted to make sure that we. Yep. If we were going to make it a permitted use, then we should, uh, our building inspector should be out there making sure that they meet all of the qualifications as it's being built. Uh, I think. And I, I think we should have that right. Right. Um, so that's what I want to make sure yeah. that, that we do. Okay. Because it's also a huge investment zone. Mm -hmm. So everybody else on board with a permitted use? If they meet these qualifications, meet the qualifications as we end up approving them. Okay. All right. Um, but back to the development standards. Um, I mean, do we want do we want to do fifteen hundred feet, as uh, Mr. Nackey suggested? Leave it at a quarter mile, which is thirteen twenty, or something else. I think if you look in the, the matrix that was sent out, like, for instance, uh, Wayne County, it's like 600 feet. Uh, and Rush County, I think it's a quarter mile from another zoning district, if memory serves me correct. Which is where I got the quarter mile from. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I took it from Rush mm -hmm. County because it made sense. Looks like 750. Is it 750? Yeah, there's, there's, there's uh, Randolph County, from a public use area, is 1320. Quarter mile. Quarter mile. Um, from a residential, it ranges from 870 to 2000. Um, Maybe we just keep it a quarter mile, and then if they, re they again, they can request a variance or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So just leave it a quarter mile, I think that'd be the easiest. Okay. Mm -hmm. I suspect some people would rather not open that can of worms. Okay. Um, have we talked about the 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 ag clauses? We talked about uh, getting rid of them. Yep. Okay. Unnecessary. Um, also, as far as in this particular one in front of us, language-wise, uh, I go back and forth between CAFO and CFO. I think the state is CFO, yep. and the federal government is CAFO. So it probably should say CFO yes. in yeah, every because instance. Because the state. The state still has a, a smaller numbers than, a, than the federal numbers, right? Yes. Because I think that's why we were we every, called. Every CAFO, C-A-F-O, is also a C-F-O. Mm -hmm. so if In you the say state C of Indiana. Yes. If you say C-F-O, you catch everything yeah. without having to. Yeah. And henceforth, the, having the definition with the actual numbers as per the uh, state of Indiana. What is that difference? Um, the difference is, is that um, the federal government regulates um, concentrated animal feeding operations, that's what that stands for, and they believe that number is at a thousand animal units, so what that means is um, 2,500 head of um, swine that are over 55 pounds, 
so bigger pigs are 2,500. Um, grocery pigs are 10,000. Uh, that would be 700 dairy cows, uh, 100,000 layers. There's a, there's a matrix that gives you an equation to get there. Um, and the federal government of the Clean Water Act regulates those. Um, basically what their regulation says is if they're designed to discharge, then they have to have a permit. But the um, CAFOs that are in Indiana and honestly nearly everywhere in the United States are designed to not discharge. So even though there is the law in the books, it doesn't really apply to the farms that are being built here because they're non-discharged. They're, they're non-discharging farms. So the state of Indiana in actually 1972 created a confined feeding regulation that made a different number. And in, the, in Indiana, we actually regulate down farther than any other state. We regulate um, at 300 head of cattle, 600 head of hogs, or 30,000 poultry. Um, and so those numbers are a lot smaller than the federal numbers. So what Indiana did was they took, um, they took what they had for the smaller farms, incorporated a lot of the things that the federal government wanted for those larger farms. You know, the federal government tried to regulate the non-dischargers and they lost in court. But the state of Indiana took those concepts for the larger farms and forced it on everybody. So we actually, even though it's not a federal regulation, the state of Indiana's code was very, very, very close to what the federal government wanted for all capo size farms, only we do it all the way down to 300. It's a windy and long, but snapshot of Okay, does anyone else have anything else that they wanted to bring up or okay. look at? Oh. Do we have a decision rendered on the, uh, uh, the separation distance? I, I think we're going to leave it at the quarter mile. Okay. I think that was the general consensus. Okay. Yeah. Leave everything at a quarter mile. Set back distance, keep it at a, a hundred because of IDEM. You can ask for a variance. Uh, submitted items. Um, that does pretty much cover everything in this, doesn't it? And I think having the copy, uh, you know, the their IDEM application answers most of the the questions. I sent everybody what what's all in the IDEM applications so that you. If you had a question, it's it's probably already answered in there. When it comes to us. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or comes to Bill. Mm -hmm. um, so, anyone else have anything else they wanted to talk about or refer to? or? I think the other thing that we need to talk about is on the first page of the livestock structure. Um, and maybe that's, we asked Jeff to help us on that. On, Creating a definition for a livestock structure that uh, can you just add in there that uh, that that is a CFO at a CFO uh, at, is a structure at a CFO will will that help us prevent the 4 H'er from falling under this? These guidelines. It makes sense to me. I mean, just I'll add something about like it could be you know, at a CFO facility. Or CFO or a facility. CFO park property. Yeah. Or a CFO livestock structure, as defined as something. Well, on that one. I mean, just would it then? I assume it probably wouldn't hurt to mention that then the uh, basically that oh, 4-H projects, 4-H kids are exempt. But right. I think I think I mean, it's, it's completely different. Like you can, unless you have thirty thousand fowl or three hundred cattle or six hundred swine. That's I mean you can have twenty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine chickens at your house if you want, and you're not a CFO. If you are again, just as a reference for state, if you are a CFO, so um, you know if you already have a permit. If you can find anything else, it also is listed on your permit. Yes, it is. So, for example, if you, and it doesn't happen very often, honestly, because it's really, it's pretty rare that it's on the same parcel, but um, uh, 
and the two that are here, I think, still, uh, let's, let's use Joe Herman for a better example because Joe Herman's the farm there in Glenwood, uh, and the house is right there. Theoretically, if they have two um, 4 H pigs and a lot next to the house, theoretically that has to be on his permit. And it usually ends up getting roped in that way. So honestly, it's it's really rare that it happens, but it also if it if there is any confinement on the CFO, IDEM will force them to include it on their permit mm -hmm. and they will have to comply with all the IDEM setbacks. So I don't I don't think it would hurt. It, you see what I'm getting at? Like I don't if you include it I don't know that's going to help or hurt anybody. If you say, if you explicitly call out, you know, smaller projects, I don't think it helps or hurts anybody because I didn't already catch in that okay. weird okay. Well, overlap. Well, related to that then, at, uh, at what point does a, a manure, what size number of animals, and when does a manure ma requirement for a manure management plan kick in? Um, say that the Indiana have a manure management plan if you haul more than 5,000 cubic yards, which isn't very much at all. Um, but it's through the state chemist office. If you're not regulated under, if you're not a CFO, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, if you've got, honestly, it's, okay, it's not very many cows, you know, so if you've got 10 or 15 cows in your home manure, you know, on your ground next to you, you know, to your house, you're, you're regulated under the state chemist office. Um, and they call the fertilizer. And you have to have a fertilizer plan because the state office regulates all com all commercial and organic mini manure fertilizer. So um, that for those smaller farms, admittedly, is complaint driven. You know, the state chemist office doesn't have enough personnel, obviously, to go knock on every single door of every single guy who's got ten cows in his yard. Um, however, they are supposed to be keeping track of the. Um, nutrients in the manure, the nutrients in the soil, how much they apply, when they apply their crop rotations and yield goals, and have that available for the state chemist office upon inspection. They have 15 days for notice of inspection to provide that to the state chemist okay. office. Okay, well part of this is also, because I'm, I'm just trying to work through some of the things with the accessory uses. That's the, uh, now, said, so, now with someone who has, you know, say someone around here has maybe, say three or four horses, mm -hmm. that, would that possibly produce enough manure for that to kick in? Probably not three or four horses. Uh, you know, um, the rule then is keep it out of the creek, uh, you yeah. know, quite frankly. Um, however, anything that, any time, you know, it doesn't matter if it's one horse or if it's 50, if they do get it in the creek, then they're automatically pulled under. So if you... That's if you item, have, isn't it? Yes, if you have three horses and you dump all their manure into the creek, you suddenly have to get a CFO permit and you come under these same regulations as everything else yeah. because you polluted. Yeah. So. Okay. So, I guess it's uh, really, you know, most, of the, most of the kids if it isn't on a farm with a CFO is that are doing, say, a, a it would not fall animals, out. just like with your daughters. Yes. I believe that's actually a felony too, right? Isn't there? There's a criminal if, code section about if you knowingly and, willfully do right. so. Okay. If you if you pile it next to the creek and you claim it, you know, if they can't prove intent, mm -hmm. yeah. they really you got to really aggravate them. You know, the only times I've ever seen them use the knowingly willfully under the criminal code um, is when guys put a pump on a lagoon bank. That's happened twice in the last 20 years that I know of. It's been and, charged in Rush County in the last five years. Yeah, I know. Uh -huh. cool. Yeah, that guy. Uh -huh. But at any rate, uh, uh, that was awesome. Uh, but that's if if it's the intent is there, then clearly they go through the criminal code. Okay. Um, but it's really hard for the smaller folks. Like, I'm a. I'm a so it's basically, like, re really, it sounds like until someone's starting to approach something that you know goes beyond really just a hobby. Yes. Yeah. It's, if if it is if you are you know producing income off of it you ha you should that's a, that's a decent trigger in your mind you know if it's a hobby it's one thing if you're if you're producing some kind of income off of it that's a decent trigger for you should be keeping track of all your income. Okay, all right. That's well. That, that that's just one. Uh, that's because like I said, it's because this is also related to you just dealing with some of the pro you know clearing up some of the misconceptions and misunderstandings we really have with the accessory uses. Yeah, and there's a lot of I mean. State chemist office usually has to deal more with like um, we're, we're close enough to Ohio. We get a lot of poultry manure from Ohio. Yeah. That's probably 50% of the state chemist workload in this region is making sure that the manure that comes from Ohio over here is properly applied. Okay. So, 
So yes. while we're talking about Monero, I had I had one other note that I wanted to, wanted us to address because I'm familiar with an incident in another county. Um, to my knowledge, we don't have anything in here regulating satellite Monero storage. I was actually nope. going to bring that up. Yeah, was, nope. um, and I really think there needs to be some language in here that protects our residents and so on and so forth, gives them the same protections uh, under our CFO for satellite manure storage. Um, and I don't know how we do that, Jeff. Maybe that's a legal that's question. That's like a Jeff question. Yeah. yeah we can, I mean, we can add a section for that or we can. So I guess. So there would so probably a, then it'd be then something similar then on the size of satellite storage. Manure storage is then uh, requiring then the permits and then the actual design. A lot of that's going to be so heavily regulated that we can probably take it back off those regulations. Right. Just take one. I'm, I'm nothing, just, I'm just concerned about the, my, right. my, I guess my biggest concern is if we have a quarter mile setback for a livestock barn, then I want a quarter mile setback for a satellite manure storage. That, that's my concern. Now the size and, the, and so on and so forth, that's going to be regulated by the state, IDAM or, or whomever. Am I correct? Yeah. Um, that's I understand there's been some legislation the written since. The administrative code for CFOs is not as 327 IAC 19. The Code of Federal Regulations is 327 IAC 20, so it's right there together if you want to look it up. And a good reference point for a county who has said we want satellite structures treated just like CFOs, Wells County did that. So you might be able to go in and look at how so they... So it sounds like we just need a definition and then under development standard say also it includes satellite, satellite, satellite structures. Because I mean, I, I, our neighbor to the north, they run into that problem where there wasn't any language and a farm was able to go in and just build whatever they wanted, wherever they wanted it. And didn't have any livestock barns, <laughs> just dug a lagoon and put it in a lagoon. And, and they transfer manure from a, another farm to that and then apply it later and um, I, I just think we need to address that because I know those residents up there were very upset because they didn't have to follow any setbacks, CAFO setbacks uh, in that neighboring county. Uh, uh, so I, I just thought uh, reading through here I think we need to protect them from the whole aspect of it. Right. Uh, not just the building itself or the livestock. We need to protect our residents from storage facilities as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, I think, um, you know, Wayne County had that issue uh, with uh, um, the, the chicken storage manure building. Uh, that's all it was built for was manure storage, satellite storage facility. Well, they didn't really have any language. Yeah. <laughs> controlled it, you know, at I think the time. I would like to point out, as a side note, I do think, I do think it should be in there. I'm not saying that, but there's nothing that stops anybody from setting manure outside and leaving it outside. If you're not regulated and it's not, you know, there's, there's some setback things, you know, there's some things that they ha should do in order to keep it out of the creek, but by and large, you know, there's, if you buy poultry manure tomorrow, you can pile it on the edge of your field, and as long as you have a berm around it that keeps water from, you know, running off of it at will, they, it can stay there for 90 days, and then you can just shuffle it around and move it over here to build another berm. I mean, there's no, there's no protection from that. I just want to make sure that that's one of those things that's clarified. It's actually better if they put it in a structure, but there's a lot more regulations if they put it in a structure. Mm -hmm. So. It's a double-edged sword. I, I do think it should be in there by all means, but it won't fix that particular problem. I don't think there's too much of that that happens in the county, but just as a side note. So, I, I mean, I don't want to get, I don't, I don't think, there again, I think this is one of those issues that probably less language will be better. Right. But I think we need to have some language in there. Um, and then, 
if they don't meet these setbacks, then they can come to the BZA and get a, ask for the variance. Right. You know, there again. I mean, if it's still, if we just say the same quarter mile, the same 100 feet setback setbacks. From a building that they build for manure storage. Yeah. Yeah. Or satellite manure storage. I mean, okay. All right. Is there anything else we need to talk about? Then I, I would. Uh, I think our goal was to be able to go to uh, a public hearing for this uh, proposal yeah. next meeting. Yeah. I would entertain a motion that uh, to uh, um, execute such uh, <coughs> such of a public hearing. Uh, I would make that motion to hold a public hearing for the CFL ordinance for the November meeting. Is there yeah, a, is <laughs> yeah, yeah, already. I, I, I had to think about that. Like, I mean, what month is this? Yeah. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Did you get those? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's been a motion made and seconded that we take these uh, changes that we've made and add it to the proposal that was in front of us tonight and um, go to a public hearing with that uh, proposed ordinance in our November meeting. Thursday before Thanksgiving. Say that again, Bill. It's the Thursday before Thanksgiving. Okay, all right. The third Thursday of November. Um, are there any questions or comments on the motion? Uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Um, no? Darren Price? Yes. Brian Durham? Yes. Gary Naylor? Yes. Kathy Rhodes? Yes. Brian Robb? Yes. Um, Bill H or Brian Hensley? Yes. And that's all that came up? Yeah. Ed's off in the air, so. Yeah, yeah we've lost him. So, uh, motion carries. Um, Brian, you've been doing the most work with this. Can you take the changes and and put together a final yeah. draft for us yeah, to build to advertise and, mm -hmm. and probably have that back. Jeff, I'll, I'll send it to Jeff. I'll have it to Jeff I probably tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Send it to Jeff and let him finalize it with the legalities of it and and then get it back to Bill for advertisement. We'll have to advertise when Bill? Okay, uh, I need it. I need everything then in the paper ten days before that. Just ten days. Yeah, not including then that Thursday. So I really need it to be published the uh, two Saturdays before. Right. Okay. So, if so Brian, if you and yeah. Jeff can kind of work on that deadline. I think we we'll probably get to him by the end of the October, so he's got plenty of time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Um, rules of procedure. Uh, and the uh, uh, and zoning code. Um, is that well, what was you well was referring just a, to? Just that there's any progress that was made with the other parts of the zoning code. Is I did got some things from the actual parking from uh, which is a significant reduction and simplification from uh, South Bend. So I forward that to Brian because I knew he was working on that also. Uh, really haven't done much else with anything else, but I have given Urban a thought to you. Uh, what I handed everybody is there's a two things to add to, uh, it has to do with submissions. And uh, notification is right now we just have the one abutting parcel property. Uh, it's pretty much a standard anymore It's being increased to most of the jurisdictions. It's 600, 650 feet from the Basically, the parcels within 660 feet from the property line, or with the smaller parcels and more densely developed area, two parcels. Okay. Then the other part is the submission and the notice. Is a submission to me to get on the agenda is 28 calendar days. Uh, then the next one the deadline will be give me seven days to uh, review and then provide notice if it's complete. Okay. Uh, yeah, no. 14 days before is the publication of the public notice and the postmarking for the abutting property owners. 
I have the staff report completed at that time, and then the uh, then the ten days to uh, post the agendas. So. Is that mostly on rules of procedure? Then? Yeah, that's rules of procedure. Yeah, that's just rules of procedure, and this would be applying to both the APC and the DCA. And so I know we still have other things with it, but uh, I think you know because I know this is one there's you know, questions about, so I've been giving this one a fair bit of thought. After some of the stuff last year, I um, I, since I've been working on the rules of procedure, I had a, I did not work on them this month. I kind of had disruption, so well, that, that's you know, perfectly understandable. Okay, all right. So under those two, is there anything that we, this board, wants to act on tonight on as far as the zoning codes and the parking and. Is there anything that needs to be? Well, yeah, I asked Brian. A, a direction he, if, given. If Brian wanted to, if there'd be a time, so uh, at some point, so uh, since Brian has shown an interest of that, I know he's also done work with the accessory uses, is as we start getting past uh, dealing with things for the, uh, the CFO, if Brian would want to say sometime with me, and then I know that Darren's also uh, worked some with that. If we can sit down and then work things into an actual draft for uh, those changes, yeah, I think that'll be okay. a good one to do. Well, okay, that's great. Yeah, because we can probably, in conjunction, then work on uh, reducing the number of uses on those tables, also. Okay. Be more broad. Yeah, because yeah, it's yeah because that's that, that kind of speaks because they made those South Bend made their. Uh, Parking requirements much more broad, also. Mm -hmm. okay. Lack much of the specificity. Amount of square footage and stuff like that. Yeah. Like ours is 150 square feet net, even though we use the gross figure. Yeah. It's language that's yeah. Aaron's language. And, uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, well, for example, one of them is it was for the uh, retail. This is uh, 400 square feet per uh, occupant. So then using the occupant load is then the actual occupant load based on the building code. So if we use the occupant load based on the building code, we don't have to define you know, the square footage net or the gross because that's already there with the uh, building code. Okay. All right. Actually, Gary, I have one more, th more thing that's not either one, two, or three, but I think it's also important uh, to get back on and uh, get completed would be a comprehensive plan, an updated comprehensive plan, and we're missing out on opportunities both at the county and the city where we don't have a comprehensive plan that's that's uh, that works, that's updated and works. 2011 is our last comprehensive plan, so we've missed out on some opportunities because of that. And uh, you know, having that, we we can work the zoning code as we go, but making sure that we're back on track for the the comprehensive and, plan. And, and Brian, to be quite honest with you, the reason that I've kind of put it on the back burner was our basically our funding source for um, the comprehensive plan went to COVID. Really? As, yeah. as, yeah. Did, as did the, the money from the Iocra plan. I mean, all the Okra money right. has went, went, into the went, same thing. went to. So even before COVID. That's what I was referring it's to. Our, Bill. He's and not the, the yeah, current okra, yeah, okra, yeah. Uh, representative. We have a, a new okra representative for this area, but the guy who replaced the, the previous okra representative, I had asked him about a planning grant, and he's like, honestly, you got to you know, find a way to come up. You don't want to put one of your okra grants that you're eligible for into a, a planning grant and be and have a whole year where you can't apply for something else from okra, you know, where you're tied into an $80,000 planning grant. Yeah, he basically said find a way to come up with the money to do the comprehensive plan without using okra to tie our our grants that we're eligible for up for a whole year I, I don't know if he had some information that maybe some other projects we're gonna take that and um, he was he was no, no I guess I guess where I'm uh, okay let's take it one step farther than that Brian and I, I don't disagree with you because I had the same thoughts but I was getting a push that we don't have the money unless we get an okra grant. So, as a commissioner, that's that's what I that's the direction I was being pushed in. However, 
the city and the county, I, I don't, I can't speak for the city yet, mm -hmm. but the county has received several dollars of okra money um, through the CARES Act reimbursement grant that could possibly be uh, earmarked some of those dollars towards this planning grant. And, and I know the city has applied. I don't know if you've. I don't know yet. For that, that you, whether you've been granted the money yet or not, but uh, we we have been granted it and we've received it. We received it. Uh, we were very fortunate. I, I think it's money that was ridiculously given to the communities. But w w if we qualify for it, we ought to take it. Right. So, um, and we did. We took advantage of it. Um, and as a county. So uh, I guess my one question or w one I, I'm kind of short-lived here but this board should be pushing our county uh, council to look at hey we need this planning grant. There are or these the, planning funds. Yeah. The, the funds for this grant. Right. Well, and, uh, to, yeah. to, to do this study. And I'll say that the more we can do the less it's going to cost. The more we can put together. I mean, if you go to a person who, um, a planner, and basically you, the data and stuff that you're providing isn't isn't all that great. They're gonna they're gonna charge you just to come up with the the data. So if we can come up with you know the most information that we can to make the planner's job as easy as possible, it's going to cost us significantly less money. I don't disagree. Yeah, so that's but sometimes. Uh, time isn't on your side when you try to do it in-house as much as possible, too. You have to be careful. <laughs> you, you have to find a happy, happy medium yeah, with that yeah, because... Yeah, because uh, I'm, I'm in-house. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, we, but, but I mean, I do agree with you, Brian. Our, our last studies, uh, so, some, of the, some of the things, they couldn't... Our... our, our planner couldn't come up or couldn't get it out of our locals what the input that they needed so they created stuff that doesn't work for Fayette County. Yeah. Connor's own Fayette County you know and you can't really blame them because they couldn't get the inputs in the first place uh, but on the other hand um, you pay them to do a job so you expect them to get the right an right input too. <laughs> So, but yes, we do need to work on that and get that back in the front bar burner. Because yeah, uh, for what we had, we spent on is actually a decent document for the amount of money. Mm -hmm. But that was the problem. Yeah. Because uh, uh, we would have, I mean, conceivably, it's uh, really for a, really, if you're going to have consultants with it, really, you're going to have to give the neighborhood $100,000 for a really quality project. Yeah. Product. Product. And, and probably that quality product would be a hundred thousand and up, yeah. depending on how much work you want and, them to do. Yeah, and frequently has been things that you need. If you would look at it, is that because it isn't uncommon, but it's another huge chunk of money. There's a lot of time parallel to other things that happen parallel. But these are rich, rich communities. It happens is frequently parallel is your economic plan. And then also your transportation plan. Those are all frequently done at the same time. And, and I think money. we talked about that early yeah, on, that, exactly. that we have to address our transportation plan mm -hmm. if we want a, a good um, uh, overall plan. Yep. So, all right. Anything else tonight? We'll move on to director's report. I don't have a copy of the director's report. I don't need, I, that's what I was trying to dig through here. To see if it was in this pile, but. Oh crap. My apologies. You sent it with the agenda. Oh, yeah. I did send it with the agenda. Did, did you? Okay. All right. That's how I got a copy of it. Did <laughs> you? I printed the agenda. agenda. You were smarter than us. For once. <laughs> you want mine? There's. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you want. Do you need to read it? Okay. Well. So we have the information. Okay. Um, for the month of September, we had a, a total no, total number of building permits. It was 15 building permits. 
Okay, for September 2019, there's 24 permits. Okay, uh, this year and last year we had uh, about one, one, one single family housing permit. This year, no. This month, last month, no manufactured housing. But what we do have versus two th 2019 is 166 permits versus 141. 10 single family dwellings through October 1st of this year versus two last year. Then this year, one manufactured home, and then last year was three. So the improvement location permits, the total through, well, we had $511. It's a total of 6,206. For the building permits, $800.80. So it gives us $9,590.47. On building permits for total up to this point of $15,287.47. The estimated construction cost for projects in September was $224,368.81. Uh, the total through October 1st so far for 2020 is $3 million, $861,198.90. Now then, the inspections is with uh, Bill Crawford did a, a total of 10 sites. After I got back over those two weeks were the uh, 37. So the actual just site visits of uh, what it, those were uh, not having to do with inspections. Those were uh, three visits. So Mr. Crawford did not do any footing inspections. I had four. So that's four projects. That means that's four projects that got started. Okay, the framing inspections was a uh, total of 12. Uh, Mr. Crawford, uh, five. I did seven. Of course, the electric permits were four for Mr. Crawford, 23 for me, and 27. But the bulk of those are the ele electric upgrades from replacing the meter bases and then the connections from the new mobile homes up at Elephant Hill uh, Mobile Home Park. So the, the owners of, the new owners of Elfield Mobile Home Park, they're putting a lot of money in up there. They really are. And because uh, right now they have, oh my God, I forget how many they still have, but they still have several more mobile homes to bring in. Each mobile home they are bringing in, they're building an actual concrete uh, drive apron. Then once they have everything bought in and then those drives, they like are going even. to then pave. Yeah it's, mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's like 30 new trailers and brand, like almost brand new trailers. Yeah, so what they're attempting it's to getting do is, closer to 100 now. Yep. Yeah, so what they they're they getting rid of all the old, hmm. the, the old the old junk that's up, that was up there. They're taking the old out and so redoing. The mm -hmm. Mechanical. It's nice. There's a built Mr. Crawford one. I did three a total of four mechanical inspections. The plumbing was two, three, and then five. And uh, the final inspections were three for Mr. Crawford, two, three, and five. So Mr. Crawford in that period of time was 16 inspections. I did 44 for a total of 60 inspections over the month of September. It's been over 44 weeks as I, yeah, I did uh, 37 uh, site visits doing 60 you know, inspections. And that's, that's the staff report. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the staff report as presented. A motion made. I'll second. Second by Darren. Darren. Motion made and seconded that we uh, accept the uh, director's report as presented. Any other questions or comments for Bill? Okay. Now, one thing is that we had a lot of permits that were issued, and I think we'll need with the time, but because of what's happened with the availability and then the cost of construction materials, several have not even been given because some of them it's cost of going through and some are really difficult to get so uh, at some point next year is uh so they're still open but you know hopefully uh, cost and availability are going to come down okay. uh, one of the things that affected availability and also cost of course were the fires on the west coast mm -hmm. that kept a lot of things from coming this way so we're going to see with that and even though we had a lot of uh so another one they didn't get a lot of installed were a lot of the swimming pools because of course with COVID-19 a lot of people came in for pool permits and uh, but uh, only a handful of them have actually been installed once again 
difficulty getting the materials to, uh, you know, fabricate the tools. Not, see, a lot of permits, but some of them are just really slow in having the work done. So, Bill, uh, and I don't mean to drag this out, yeah. uh, but on those, aren't, aren't there expiration dates on those? Yeah, they're, they're 12 months. So when it comes time, is so the uh, so when it comes time, what I will do is I'll just request the area plan commission to go ahead and extend without having to charge another. Fee. That's what I was wondering if we yeah. could help these Absol along. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Under these circumstances, yeah, it, it's an unusual circumstance, and uh, for things like that, is that uh, you know, people shouldn't have to pay for permit again right. for uh, things that are outside of their control. Outside of their control. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay. All right. Um, motion made and seconded. Any other comments or questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the same sign. Motion carries. And then one thing before adjournment. Uh, is that, Jeff, this is a question for you. Uh, the extension of permits, is that something that we can just make a resolution to extend that? Or do we have to do it on a case by case? Like we can say any permit issued after March 1st. Well, I, I think what it would be, probably the best one would be for the, as it gets closer to the time next year, would be to uh, then grant me the authority on a case by case basis for, uh, to, to yeah, extend those. To for extend those. For say, ex you allow me to extend those. Are we really going to have issues though, or are we just thinking of mine? Well, I, we probably will, but we don't have any yet. So it's just, it, it's kind of a heads I'd like, up. I'd like for your department and this board to be prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just know that's something that they have to you know, come to APC and ask for an No, no, no. It should be something, I think it should be something that you would grant me the authority to do that. What I don't know is we probably likely have something in our policy already granting extensions, do we not? Not along those lines because you it's, tomorrow's. but uh, we, we don't have anything in there with those, but I think that's something we probably should yeah. grant, uh, develop. Uh, I'll look to make sure, but Thank you. yeah, mm -hmm. we should have something in there that you can grant extensions if yeah. there's a valid reason. Yeah. Because it's not just being told there are buyers or anything. No, no, there's just a lot of things that happen. Okay, one other thing before we uh, adjourn that I would like for us to kind of be on board, all of us understand what, as far as the public hearing coming next month, and Jeff help me, yeah. what we can and can't do after that public hearing with with this draft that we're we're going to present at the public hearing. It's my understanding this board can pass uh, pass that as presented. Correct. Amend it at that hearing. Correct. Mm -hmm. And pass it as amended. Correct. Or turn it down for further study. Or just continue it to the next Or continue meeting. it to the next meeting. It's important to note that the APC is not passing it. The APC is not making recommendations. Making recommendations. You're, all you're doing is making a recommendation to the commissioners. Um, and favorable and run and it doesn't make sense. And the city council? Also, no. will it not go to the city council? Oh, yeah, I, yeah, it I always it, forget. It, it's an AP since it's very plain commission. Yeah. Work, right. yeah. Um, I forget. So yes, yeah, so it'll have to go to both. But essentially, all you're all you're doing is making a, a recommendation. They can they can then change it. They can deviate from it. They have to send it back to you once they do. But they they don't. They're not just stuck with either accepting it or rejecting it. They can also accept it with these changes. But we will not be required if if there is an amendment made to the 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 document that's presented for public hearing. It comes back to the planning commission. It does not have to be there does not have to be another public hearing on that. Right. As Are you talking about for next month? If if next month because what, if I understand it right we'll open the for public hearing. Correct. Then we'll close the public hearing. Correct. Discuss the uh, motion or, or the ordinance that is in front of us Correct. without any public input. It'll just be the board itself. Mm -hmm. The board will have the capabilities of amending that after they've heard public statements. If we choose to make any amendments, 
Do we have to advertise for a second no, no, public no, no, hearing? No, 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 you can pass. You can pass it and just say these with these changes. This ordinance with these changes. Okay. Does everyone un understand? So what let's we're say let's say you got there and you said we're going to change from a quarter mile to a half mile. You you can you can do that that after that hearing and then that would be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So so we could get this. We could possibly get this all buttoned up with one public hearing. Oh, yeah. We don't have to have multiple public hearings every time a change no, 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 no. is made. To. No. Okay, all right. Yeah, because, okay, now, if I recall correctly now, for example, say, if it's rejected by the legislative body, and then also, or they amend, it's, it has to come back to the Area Planning Commission. Because what happened the last time was after the amendments by the county commissioners, it came back to the Area Planning Commission, and they rejected those, and then, of course, the key county commissioners went ahead and adopted it as they had amended. So, yeah. okay. So basically, it's like, you know. So if we, if this board would send to 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 the county commissioners or the city council uh, a favorable recommendation, yep. and one and one of those bodies votes it votes against that favorable recommendation. They, they're, they're legally required to send it back. Okay. We hear at the next hearing, and then the Area Plan Commission will, and it has to be accompanied by the reasons why. They can't just, they cannot just say, we reject it. But they have to have the reasons for it. They need to provide the reasons for the amendment also. Okay. So it has to be a rational reason for doing so. Okay. And, and then yeah, we're that, still a recommending body, though. Yeah, it still comes back, and uh, yeah. So, for example, uh, the you know, the area plan commission agrees with them; it goes back, and then it's good. So, but if the area plan commission, if I recall this correctly, because it's been a while, so if I recall correctly, the area plan commission, uh, if they say no, we don't agree with those explaining why you don't, but then it goes one last time and it doesn't go any farther if the commissioners go ahead and then adopt their own changes. It, so, it's so not an endless, endless cycle. So it, what happened, I, if, it, if I may, in 2011, the Area Plan Commission recommended to the commissioners an ordinance. They had a public hearing that several of them actually, they recommended an ordinance to the commissioners and to city council. Those two bodies added in several amendments and sent it back to the Area Planning Commission. The Area Planning Commission rejected it and said, we don't like your amendments, we like what we sent you the first time. The county commissioners and the city council said, we don't really care, we like our amendments, and they adopted the amendments. Yep. Yeah. So do, do the commissioners and the city council have to adopt the same? The same. Yeah. Yes, they and they yeah they have right. to adopt whatever the same idea. Yeah, because yeah. we're unified. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, they don't necessarily have to have the same things, but it's really nice and clean if uh, they both adopt the same thing. Yeah, there were the amendments that were added. Some were added by the commissioners and some were added by city council, but they just agreed together. I actually still have the document if you'd like to read it. But they're like, oh, well, our friends over at the commissioners, they did these and we liked them, but we'd like to add this. And the commissioners were like, oh, well, we like that one too. We'll put it in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Mr. <laughs> if I may, um, one other thing I, I want to note because. Um, Sometimes these public hearings can get interesting. Can get um, you get some people that come in that are very emotional both ways. Um, I'll be happy to step in at any point um, if you guys feel like you're being. The, the 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 thing you need to know is this is the one opportunity where people get to speak. Okay, it, you know during during this time right now somebody couldn't just come in and speak. Right, there are certain opportunities. Even though it's a public hearing, there are only certain times where they actually get the right to speak. This is one of those opportunities. I would tell you that. Um, there's going to be people that will look at one of you and ask you questions. You can, of course, answer that, but you don't have to. Okay, this isn't an inquisition. They don't have the opportunity to, to, to treat you poorly. They don't have the opportunity to, to inquire of you anything at all. Okay, so I'll be happy. I don't have a problem in the world shutting that down. All you have to do is give me a look, and I'll, I'll make sure to shut that down. Okay, yeah. but don't at all feel compelled that you need to explain yourself or you need to explain your decisions, or you need to be answering questions, that's not what that is, okay? Yeah. So this is merely an opportunity for them to give you information, for them to state their, their positions, their thoughts, 
and you take those into account. That's it. Okay, mm -hmm. you don't have to. They're not somebody that can force you to, to yeah. speak. Okay, so yeah. just I always that tends to happen at some of these, and I want to make sure that you guys are comfortable doing that. Okay. Yeah, because it'll be at the at the prior to the meeting. It'll be on the form that these are what the rule. These are the rules. These are the rules we have. You must make your comments to the president of the board. So. Well, nothing else. I'll make the motion to adjourn. <laughs> was it asked for? Was it? It. <laughs> okay. Motion made and seconded for adjournment. Any other questions or comments? All in favor, signify the same aye. All opposed, the same. Motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Thank, Thank you very much for the input. <laughs>